Good morning, guys. Thanks so much for joining me today for our session on strategic marketing on a shoestring budget. My name is Christy. I'm a presenter and an advisor for Business Station as part of the Digital Solutions Program. Um, and today, what we're going to go through is a lot of, um, I guess, mostly the strategy behind marketing, but then how that ties into and how being strategic can, in fact, uh, save you a lot of money, a lot of money, sorry, and allow you to um, conduct your marketing on a much lower budget. So what we're going to go through is based on my personal experience. I do also own and operate my own business and a lot of the um, tactics that we'll talk about today um, and the research that sort of sits behind that is what I implement um, every day as well. So the session is designed to be as interactive as you'd like to make it. Um, please stop me at any time and ask questions through the chat functionality. Um, so if you've got anything that you think of um, as we're going, just pop in questions there and we'll also have some time at the end of the session um, as well. Okay, so in terms of what we're actually going to go through today, um, we're going to identify the components of a marketing strategy and a marketing plan and talk about how a strategy can, in fact, have huge financial benefits or being strategic uh, is probably more the term, uh, can, can really um, have those financial benefits. Uh, we'll identify a range of low-cost marketing tactics that you might be able to implement within your business. Some you might already be doing, some maybe new concepts to you. So hopefully there's something you can pick out of that. Um, and then we'll also look at the importance of measuring and controlling your marketing activities to make sure that you're actually producing sales and that you're spending your marketing money effectively. Um, okay, so before we get into that, just to really to define what marketing is. Marketing is anticipating the needs and wants of targeted customers uh, and managing the process through which those needs and wants are satisfied. But in doing so, you ob um, obviously have to do it profitably. Um, another key word within this statement or this definition is targeted. Um, you have to know exactly who you're selling to so that you can know their specific needs and wants and therefore provide them exactly what they want and provide it where and how they want it. So one of the key elements that we're looking at today is the theory that successful marketing doesn't have to cost your small business significantly, but you absolutely need to know the results of what you're doing so that you can make sure that you're spending your money in the right areas. Um, and that's where strategic planning comes into it. So a lot of small businesses tend to create a business plan. Um, a lot of the time that's done when you're actually starting up your business. But I find that with the day-to-day -day running of the business, a lot of time can go by um, before, before you actually refer back to that plan, if at all. Some businesses will just develop it for the purpose of obtaining finance or, you know, when they first set up their business and that just gets popped on the shelf. But a lot can happen in a business. Um, from, you know, the time you started up to where you are now currently in your business. Priorities can shift. Um, you might introduce new products or services. You may have some key personnel that were, you know, integral parts of the business that have come and gone. Um, so thinking about that, thinking about your own uh, business structure and your business planning, do you have a business plan and when did you last review it if you do have one? Now, I think the best way to make sure that you're marketing effectively and reaching your business goals is to go through that important process of planning annually, at least annually, unless something changes. I would, um, you know, look at replanning if, if something within your business changes, but an annual um, planning day or, you know, the annual review of your business plan is always a good idea. So I would just make sure that you are taking the time to not only um, have a look at, at what your goals are and, and where you sit as a business, but measure your progress in goals that you had already um, defined in your business plan. And then you'll have a look at the specific steps that you're going to take in the future year and the coming year to make sure um, that you stay on track to those goals. That will then tie in with your marketing strategy and being able to market in a cost-effective way. So to define the strategic planning elements of your business, I would have a look at the pyramid that you see on your screen now. Marketing strategy has to align with the overall business planning goals and your strategy then defines your marketing mix, which is essentially your price, your product, your promotion and your place or your distribution. And then the marketing plan, um, the smallest part of that pyramid is essentially just the implementation of it all. That's allocating marketing resources, um, implementing in individual marketing activities and obviously the budgeting that sits around that. So marketing strategy is what we're talking about here. And what that is, is really the selection of a course of actions um, that involves defining specific customer groups, specific communications methods, 
distribution channels and your pricing structures. So it's really a combination of your target markets and your marketing mix, essentially. Um, the reason it helps so much is that it really allows you to do the research, do the work and find what works, um, use that and stay focused to it. Um, so thinking about your business plan and your marketing strategy, do you have one or the other? Um, if you have both, that's fantastic. How um, how long has it been since you've you reviewed them? So I think, um, you know, for a lot of small businesses, de de developing a marketing strategy um, it seems, seems a bit overwhelming or, uh, you know, it could come with a bit of overhead if you're paying someone else to do it for you. And then once you get that strategy, if you are paying someone to develop it for you, you might find that um, they've suggested, you know, a fair amount of marketing spend associated with the strategy that they've developed. Um, but hopefully what we can break down today is that you can, in fact, develop your own marketing strategy. It doesn't have to be expensive uh, to actually develop the strategy itself. It does take time and effort. Um, and then the actual marketing dollars that you spend um, also doesn't have to be high. We can keep that nice and low considering that you're going to be so focused and so targeted. So strategic planning is, um, as I mentioned, quite an extensive process. Um, I like to look at it annually. And for me to develop a marketing strategy, it does take a number of weeks. And that's the time that you really need is to research and to process that information, to analyze it and then go back. So it's not a matter of um, sitting down and developing a marketing strategy in one session or in one week. Um, I like to spend that time to go back and forth with the document so that you can start to think about the results, what they mean. Um, research is really the key element around that. Um, once you've done all of the research and learned um, a lot along the way, you will develop a strategy around that. So some of the key strategic research areas um, are listed on the screen there. So starting with um, some internal and external research, a SWOT analysis, um, that's marketing 101. If you've done any marketing courses, training, or you know even been involved in developing a marketing plan in the past, you would have heard that term. So it's an um, analysis of your strengths and weaknesses, which are internal factors, and opportunities and threats, which are external factors um, that have the ability to positively or negatively impact your business. Then you've got a pest analysis. Um, a pest is your political, economic, social, and technological factors. And there's an extension to pestle analysis if environmental and legal factors also impact your business. So again, having a look at what those factors are and noting them down. Some of them you will be able to take action based on knowing what they are. Others you won't be able to take action, but it's important that you're aware that they are factors. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, then you've got a sales analysis. So I always look at um, your own internal sales uh, results, watch how that's been tracking in the past. Have you seen any trends, growth, decline, um, or do you have any planned growth areas? So uh, planned growth over specific periods of time or for specific products or services. So to really have a look at that data um, helps to, you know, lay it out month by month, year on year to just really do a comparison of how things have tracked over the last three years is always a good um, <clears throat> snapshot. Um, but keep in mind, we have had COVID and a few strange things going on in between that sort of three year period. So maybe even look at a longer period, look at pre-COVID, during COVID, and then, you know, what you anticipate it to look like post-COVID. Um, from that, I would also, um, and from a lot of the research that you do, you will need to define your unique selling proposition or your USP. And that really is what it is that you're pitching to your clients. What is it about your business that makes you truly unique? Now, the key thing about that is you have to have something in your business that makes you truly unique um, and differ from your competitors so that you can stand um, out from your competitors. But it also has to be something that customers want. So through your research on, of customers, and that ties into the next part of target markets, as you start to research who the market is and what their needs and wants are, you will uncover that there will be specific needs. Um, hopefully, there are some needs that your competitors aren't servicing that you can offer. So something that makes you unique, as in no one else is doing it, um, and it's in demand. So your customers actually want it. So within defining your target market, um, I'm going to touch on that um, or I'm going to expand on that because that, I believe, is the most crucial element of marketing strategically. Um, but a key element, obviously, of the strategy as well is to really define who these target markets are. 
Um, then you've got your marketing mix. Um, that's your four P's, your product, price, place, and promotion, which I'll um, expand on a, sh a little bit shortly. Then you've got your budgeting, so your financial analysis and budgeting. So think about how you budget for marketing. Um, benchmark is generally between 4 and 10% of your gross revenue should be the equivalent of what you spend on marketing. Um, and it's said that 4% will maintain your market position, whereas extending that to, you know, that 10% range will grow your position. Um, but I would really have a look at that. One thing with small business is that you can never... And um, you can't just pull money out of the air, obviously. So when you are looking at budgeting and that kind of thing, um, have a look at what you've spent in the past and try and have a look what sort of percentage bracket that sits in. Uh, if you can, try and keep it quite similar so that you know that it's achievable and within the own constraints of your business. Um, you, with your financial analysis and budgeting, you also have to consider what expenses there will be associated with the production of your marketing plus also advertising spend. Within that, you also need to know your cash flow. So you're going to have to know when you're actually going to have money to be able to spend on marketing. Um, there will also be some critical assumptions of your financial analysis. Um, so you'll consider here what the impacts um, would be if there were changes in those assumptions. Um, so we'll expand on that a little bit more um, as well. And, and like I said, some of these areas are very straightforward and quite obvious, whereas some do require a lot more explanation. Um, I'm going to expand on them now. So I'm going to expand on your target market and your marketing mix, but a little bit more. But keep in mind, as I said, just this research of these key areas that I've mentioned here will normally take me a good you know, three, four, five weeks. Um, and that's because research is um, time consuming, but you also need to give yourself a bit of space um, from it. So, you know, do a bit of research, go away, think think about it. Um, that may uncover more questions and you'll have to do a little bit more research. Um, and that's that's the key thing, you know, getting the, the, the data is really important, but analyzing and interpreting that data is the crucial element here. Okay, so to expand on your target markets, as I said, I believe that this is the most important component of marketing and you have to truly know your target market. Now, what a target market is, it's a, a market segment that has been selected by your business for target for marketing attention, sorry. So it is not um, who you get through your doors at the moment, or whilst it could be, but it's not necessarily who you get through your doors. This is who you actually want to get through your doors. Now, through research of who your target market is or who it could be, you might find that there are target um, segments that no one's reaching or communicating to, or there might be um, target markets that are being served by your competitors at the moment, but perhaps they're not doing a good job of that. Or there could be other target markets that, um, you know, they, they look, everything on paper stacks up, they look like it, they could be a good target market, but perhaps they're saturated with options. So there's lots of competitors in that space. So um, they could be a little bit more difficult to get to. Um, but to be a viable market segment, you would have to um, have a think about uh, them meeting some key criteria. So the first criteria would be that um, you need to group them so that they're homogenous. So they should be alike within their segments. Um, there's no rule that says you only have to have one target market. You can have different target markets for different products or different seasonality, different times of year, um, but they have to be grouped um, because of their um, characteristics or common characteristics. Um, they obviously have to differ from the general population and be different to other target segments um, and they have to be large enough to be financially viable. So you might have a market segment that's coming through your door. Um, you, you know, they represent some good revenue to you, but they're not large enough to actually support their own advertising campaign, for example. Um, so that's a, another key element to consider. Now, consumer markets um, can be segmented or they can be divided along a number of different dimensions um, or, and, and, you know, as I mentioned, this is, um, you know, common characteristics is what you're looking at here. So the most um, obvious is demographics, and that's generally um, the easiest and, and where people go when they start to think about target markets. Um, but I would also think about psychographics or behaviour. Um, you can group people by um, generation, their geographic location, the benefits and usage of your product or service. Um, so keep that in mind. But you will have to divide them into groups with these common characteristics. Now, if you don't have a clear image of your target market, 
as a small business, um, you try to reach everyone and what happens, you end up appealing to almost nobody um, because your message is too diluted, your, um, your placement of your advertising is unclear or perhaps ineffective because you're trying to reach a mass market. So think about your target market. You should be able to describe that person um, and everything about them and even visualize them. Um, some businesses will create avatars um, so that there's a persona, a digital persona that actually sits behind their target market. So then when they go to place an ad, they know exactly who that person is that they're talking to. And that tells you um, how to talk to them. It tells you where to talk to them, where they consume media, therefore where you should place your communications methods, um, communications and, and um, messages, sorry, and also um, your advertising. So very, very important and absolute crucial element in marketing on a shoestring budget. Um, if you are only advertising and only spending money to the exact person that represents your customer, then no marketing dollar should be wasted. Okay, the marketing mix is the second thing I wanted to expand on. Um, now, this includes controllable factors that have been chosen by your business to satisfy your customers' needs. So the four controllable factors are your product, your price, your place, and promotion. Now, you may have heard of the seven Ps if you include people, processes, and physical environments. So it really depends on your business as to whether or not you expand into the seven Ps. Um, but most businesses, you will at, need, at least need to consider the four Ps. So when you're looking at these elements, um, first of all, we'll talk about your products. So when you're looking at your product or service range, think about whether your products um, and your product range complements each other. So each product sort of works in and ties in um, with the other. Um, does it suit who you've identified as your target audience? So perhaps you've done some research, you've determined um, a new target audience for your business. You may then need to relook at your products and go, okay, do we need to make an adjustment here to appeal more to our target market? Um, so that's really, really important. And sometimes, you know, an opportunity might come about where you've identified, hey, there's this emerging target market. I'm quite interested in, in them because they represent a good opportunity. Um, my competitors aren't in this space or they are, but I want to um, also be in this space and you, your product needs to be developed accordingly. And that's very, very common. So you can never expect a customer to change their needs and wants to suit your products and services. You will always have to be redefining, reinventing or updating your products and services to suit the changing needs of your customers. Um, that then leads into price. So having a look at now that you know who your target market is, how does your pricing suit this market? Um, also, how does your pricing compare to competitors? You will um, hopefully have done it something like a competitor analysis to determine um, what your competitors are charging. Um, think about your price, um, each price in your product range as well. How does it um, sit alongside other products and services, um, and making sure that that makes sense as well. So if you've got one product that's at a certain price and then another product that's quite similar, but the price is vastly different, does that make sense to the customer or is it confusing? So they don't know which one to go for, so they go for neither. Um, the last element of pricing, which is um, something that I find the most interesting, um, particularly speaking and working with a lot of small businesses, is making sure that your pricing allows for enough profit. Now, there's a number of ways that you can look at pricing. You can um, price based on, um, you know, a cost plus, so what it costs you plus a standard markup. You can price it based on your competitors, having a look at what they charge and, you know, taking it down a little bit, putting it up a little bit, um, or based on what your customers are willing to pay. But essentially, you need to consider all elements of pricing and make sure that you are profitable. Also understand when you're setting your pricing, um, which products are more profitable um, than others, you know, so how, do, how does that affect your pricing? Then you've got your place or your distribution. So this is where buyers might look for your products or services. Um, is it online? Um, is it face-to-face uh, -face or a walk-in sort of shop front? Um, do you sell your products or services through an agent or some kind of wholesale arrangement? Um, thinking about that you need to make sure that you can access the right distribution channels. If you do wholesale your products or services, you would have to go back to pricing and incorporate that into your strategy because you would have a much lower wholesale price than you would your retail price. 
So you'd have to understand what percentage of your products or services you'll sell at a wholesale level versus a retail. Um, the last element or the fourth P, we're not going to go into all seven just for today, but the, um, the fourth P for the purpose of today's session is promotion. So having a think about that, what's your strategy around promoting your product or service? So where are you going to market it? Um, how are you going to get to your market? If you're attracting consumers directly, for example, what sort of advertising or communications methods will you use? Because you know everything about your target market, um, you will know um, where they're consuming media and therefore where you get, have to or should be placing advertising um, and you'll know what type of methods will appeal to your target market. Um, so this promotion area is directly linked to your target market. Um, well, all elements are, but um, this one in particular. Um, you have to really know that target market extremely well to be able to determine how and where you're going to promote your products and services. So that was an absolute fly through of the development of a marketing strategy. It really does take time and patience while you research. Um, and in all honesty, we could do a full day session on developing a marketing strategy. But I think the key point here is really to understand that you can be very targeted and you can spend your funds, particularly if funds are limited, very, very well with a solid strategy behind you. So not based on what you think you know, not based on historical information, but based on new, fresh research. Even if that research, all it does is backed up what you already knew as a business owner, which sometimes is the case, um, but there's no question then. Um, so the key reasons that you should strategically plan are really that it composes the big picture and it does it through pinpointing the specific target markets that you're going to serve, through determining your customers' needs and wants through market research and making sure that you are satisfying them, but analyzing your competitive advantages and then build your marketing strategy around what it is that actually makes your business differ or stand out from the rest. And then you create that marketing mix that meets the needs and wants of the customers that you've defined. Um, so sounds pretty straightforward, but some key considerations are that um, your strategic plan has to match your resources and your capabilities. And obviously that's for long-term growth and survival. Um, you can't be, um, you know, over budgeting for advertising spend if that's not going to, to work um, with your existing budgets and what you've spent in the past, as an example. Um, the other key consideration is that you have to factor in all components to get that true big picture. Now, the other thing I'll touch on is that I really do believe that strategic planning is an integrated activity. Um, I think that you should involve as many people in your business as possible. Um, and the reason being is as a business owner, you might be um, very much focused on back of house, uh, you know, stuff, or, or even you could be very hands on and there could be things going on in other areas where you're not involved that you might um, you might not be aware of and therefore you might miss something. Um, so I'd recommend involving your entire team or at least a selection of team members to talk about marketing. At the very least on an annual basis, get together, generate some ideas, allow people to give some feedback. Um, if you're in marketing, you have to also fully understand what you're doing from a marketing sense and how that can impact operations, for example. Um, so keep that in mind. That's really the most important element of marketing on a shoestring budget. Um, is being strategic, knowing exactly who you're talking to, what products they want, um, where these targeted customers are consuming media, um, and that's where you should advertise um, and involving, um, you know, doing that research at a ground level. And that should really result in no marketing dollar being wasted. Uh, so now we're going to have a look at some low-cost marketing activities that I would recommend. Um, We've, you've done the research, or let's say you've done the research, you know your specific audience, um, you're targeting your advertising towards that audience, you know where they consume media. Um, so factoring in all that, I believe then there are some essential low-cost marketing activities to consider. First of all, online. Obviously, a lot of what we're going to talk about um, in the second part of this webinar uh, now is about online um, advertising and online marketing, but do an online audit. Make sure your online setup is solid. So look at your website, look at SEO, um, which is search engine optimization. I'll expand on that and remarketing at a bare minimum. 
Um, make sure that you're getting referrals and reviews online. Make sure that you're listening to those reviews um, or you've got alerts set up so that you're getting the reviews straight away. You're assessing them and responding to them. They could be Google reviews. They could be Facebook reviews. Or they could be industry specific, like, um, you know, there's Urban Spoon, there's Yelp, there's um, TripAdvisor, all kinds of different industry specific review sites as well. Um, personalized marketing is absolutely the way forward. So try and personalize all of your marketing, whether that's email um, marketing that speaks directly to the customer about products and services that they've purchased in the past or about their geographic location and everything that you know about them. But also on social media, talk to your audience, talk to them about things that are relevant to what they're interested in um, or relevant events at relevant times of year. Um, in terms of uh, gaining new customers, new customers um, are really, really important. Now, it does cost, well, you know, it, it, this, the, um, it, I guess the research sort of backs up. Sorry, can I get my words out there? But it does um, it cost around eight times more to attract a new customer than it does to retain an existing. So it's really important that you retain in your existing customers through loyalty programs and that kind of thing. However, um, you have to get the, these new customers in the door um, as quickly and easily as possible. Once you've got them, they cost so little to keep subject to your customer service. So have a look at new, new customer offers. What can you offer them to get them in the door uh, for the first time? Um, also look at your value proposition, your unique sales um, proposition or unique selling points. Focus on developing content um, in and around all of your advertising, whether that's web, social media, um, anything that you're doing that really focuses on your USPs and highlights it. So you can really storytell through your, con uh, your content. PR is really important as well. You can be your own PR advocate. Um, you should be able to get some free publicity. Um, you should know how to engage with the media. We actually do media and PR training or we do a, a webinar specifically on media and PR um, and how you can generate free publicity. But as small business owners, um, you've quite often got an interesting story and there's interesting people behind that story. So certainly don't be afraid to be your own PR advocate. Um, sponsorship opportunities are another area that you can consider. Um, obviously, you well, in small businesses, I find a lot of the time you are approached about sponsoring um, different events or perhaps donations and that kind of thing a lot. Um, but the key thing here is it can represent um, good marketing spend if your target market and the target market of the, the um, organization are perfectly matched. That could then equate to a really good PR opportunity. So imagine you've got a, um, you know, a local charitable organization that's all um, organizing a gala dinner and they've offered you to be a major sponsor, give some products or services away. Have a think about who's going to be sitting at that dinner, who is their audience. And if you can perfectly match that audience to who you've defined as your target market, then that puts you in front of a room of, let's say, a thousand people that are likely to be your customers. Therefore, it's a good um, marketing opportunity as opposed to, you know, if nobody in that room would be likely to buy your product or service, um, it would be a complete waste of your time. So keep that in mind. Um, also, the last point there is don't forget about grassroots marketing, things like signs and handouts, billboards, um, you know, even your own car signage, those kind of things are pretty simple um, sometimes we get so focused on the online and, and new marketing um, tactics that you kind of forget about that old stuff, but it does help. Um, and also don't forget traditional marketing. Um, although a lot of uh, people, particularly in the digital space, will say that it is, um, it's phasing out or it's dying off. And uh, I do also agree that there is a large trend to an increased spend in digital advertising as opposed to traditional. But if there are traditional opportunities that arise, assess them make sure that the opportunity um, and whatever the advertising is, that the audience perfectly matches yours. Have a look at your budget. If it fits in with your budget, the audience perfectly matches yours, then it could be a good opportunity. So my point there is don't turn your back on it completely. Consider all opportunities. Now, we're going to explore some key online marketing tactics and how to market your business best online now. Um, and the reason being is that every business, no matter your industry, should be online. Now, you can really maximize your online presence 
Um, you can get new business or capitalize on every marketing dollar spent in an online sense because it can be so targeted. Um, and of course, it's so trackable as well. So that takes the guesswork out of it. Um, you don't have to wonder if what you're doing is producing the right results. You can actually measure that. So starting off uh, with your website. So your website is the core of your online marketing. Um, and it absolutely is the core. Everything that you do, whether it be flyers, brochures, even your car, like we're talking about some traditional and you know grassroots sort of marketing stuff, it all normally leads back to your website. So it is the core, but it's only part of your overall strategy. So potential customers still need to be able to find that site. Um, you have to actively engage with current and future customers online in a social sense. So it can't be the only thing that you do, but it is a major part of what you're doing. Um, so we'll talk more about the SEO side of things shortly, but for your website itself, this is a place where customers can find it out about your products and services. Um, hopefully they can make purchases um, and you might have bricks and mortar, so you might have a retail front, but this is a place where they can engage with you, um, you know, outside of those hours or your core, your core business could be an online business. Um, so I would think of your website as your 24 hour day, number one salesperson. So considering that, is it doing you justice and is it selling your product or service and your business as it should? So there are some key design elements when you're looking at your website. Um, first of all, your hero images. So it should have large hero images that really highlight and tell the story of your product. Um, stock images, I would sort of steer away from. I need mean, to get your website launched. Some stock images can be okay, but try and get your own imagery that factor in real people. Um, obviously, that should also factor in your target market. So if you've got people using your product or service on your website, it should represent your target market. So those people should um, be representative of that market. Um, your navigation should be easy. Test it with family and friends, get them to try and buy something or take some actions on your website and watch them do it and see how easy or hard it is. Um, there should be strong calls to action, like your shop now, buy now, contact us, call us. Those kind of buttons are really important that really lead people to what you want them to do next. Uh, your website should also be fully responsive. And now that means, um, similar to the picture that you see on your screen now, it should look good um, and it should adapt its size and shape uh, no matter what device it appears on. So whether it's a desktop, a tablet, a mobile, it should adapt the menu structure and the overall um usage of the site should work uh, for your customers. Um, content is the next thing. There should be plenty of content. Customers should be able to get enough information about your business and that content should flow. Um, so the content also helps with SEO and how well you rank on search engines. So Google and other search engines need content on the website to understand what your business is about. Um, and images obviously help tell that story and sell your product to um, to the customer, but content is the fundamental sort of element um, when it comes to SEO. But also for your customer, they need to be able to build enough trust with, uh, with you, find out enough information to be able to go to that next step, which is to buy, to contact you or whatever it is that you want them to do next. Now, everything about your website should be speaking to and aimed at your target markets. As I said, so your images are really important, but your design, your colors, your fonts, even the technology and functionality should be designed with your target market in mind. So who is it that you're aiming your marketing towards? Um, look at those target markets and make sure that everything on your website actually appeals to them. Now, having a great website is crucial, um, but you also need people to be able to find it. And that's where SEO comes into it. Now, SEO, I've used the term a couple of times. Um, SEO is search engine optimization. So in very simple terms, that's the process of improving your website to increase its visibility in search engines. Now, for SEO to be effective or worth your while, you have to do keyword research. Now, we have a, an entire webinar on keyword research because it's such an interesting topic, but it's so important when it comes to SEO and um, your marketing strategy. Um, you need to know what people are actually searching and what volumes there are of, um, of searches on relevant terms. So let's say uh, you've got a, a cafe in Perth um, and you want people to find you. Are people searching Perth Cafe or are they searching 
Perth coffee or you know have a think about some of those terms um and basically for yourself um as you know the key person involved in the business you should be able to brainstorm a few terms what do you think people are searching and then use tools online to back it up so you know in a particular tool um like your uh, google keyword planner tool or keywords everywhere you can type in a term like that um, and it will actually tell you how many monthly searches there are on that term. So it's really important. And there's a little bit more science to it, hence why we have an entire webinar on keyword research. But it's really important that you get that perfect balance of enough volume. If there were only 100 people a month searching that term, is that enough for you? Um, but it has to be narrow enough to be people that are looking for a business exactly like yours. Um, but also, um, you know, not too narrow that there's not enough search volume. So that's kind of the key thing with keyword research. Once you've done the research and you know exactly what people are searching to get to your business, um, you then have to um, look at um, implementing some SEO tactics. Um, and it really is a combination of the hundreds of different tactical efforts. It continually changes and evolves. So things that you may have done in the past that resulted in really good rankings, may not be as significant now. So you have to continually um, fine tune uh, your SEO efforts and it does take time. So if you were to make some changes today, you might want to you know, wait or allow a few weeks to a month before you start seeing any results. And because it does constantly change, you have to make sure that if there are any algorithm changes, you're across those and you're making adjustments. Um, now, SEO, um, it's a major uh, topic in its own right. And again, we have webinars um, and workshops that are dedicated just to this topic. So I'm only going to touch on it very lightly. Um, but please reach out um, and find more information on anything we talk about today. Um, and just to expand a little bit more on SEO, it includes on-page and off-page um, optimization techniques. Um, so on the page SEO is everything that happens on your website that affects its ranking. Um, so things like readable URLs, uh, making sure that your, your URL is actually readable. So, you know, your website.com.au forward slash training as opposed to forward slash and some codes um, or, you know, some yeah, just numbers and letters. So it has to be readable. Um, it, good internal linking is really important, which is page to page linking on relevant content. So you, on your homepage, you might start talking about your product range. As you talk about product A, that's a clickable link that goes straight to your product A page. Product B goes straight to product B page. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, um, but really, really important from a user perspective because it makes it easy, um, but also for, um, from an SEO perspective. 301 redirects, um, that's just basically redirecting if, you, if you're if you changing pages or taking pages down, rather than sending people to an error page, this redirection will take them to a new location um, so that they're still going somewhere on your site. Um, page load time is really important. Always keep an eye on the speed. Uh, things like image sizes and unused code sitting behind um, the scene can really impact speed. Google actually has a great developer tool where it's a page um, speed test. Um, it will analyze the speed of your, your website and then give you quite a comprehensive report about what you could improve and what's causing um, any uh, lagging sort of or slower speed um, page load times. So keep that in mind. There's also page title tags, meta descriptions, alt tags, heading tags. They are a little bit more technical, so we are going to go into them in a bit more detail. Starting with title tags. Uh, now, it's a unique title tag. Now, that's what you see in the red box on your screen. Um, it's generally, well, it should include the main keywords for that page. So this is not the headline that's that's on top of that actual page of your website. This is um, something that you've stipulated. It's only in the code view. Um, but if you've got a good content management system, it should have something like an SEO plugin where you it will have a title tag or page title tag section and you just type in what you want it to be. So Google and other search engines will use this to display as the main title in search results like you see here. Um, the optimal length of this is about 60 characters. So that's long enough to display a good title without it getting cut off. Don't use stock words like the, is, and those kind of things because they don't have any um, value for um, from an SEO perspective. Um, and the preferred format here is to put your primary keywords first um, and then secondary keywords. So it is a critical factor for um, web bots um, 
in determining how well you ran, but it can also really heavily, heavily influence um, users or visitors because they're searching these terms, all the results are coming up. You then want them to, your, you want your page, sorry, to appeal to them enough for them to actually click and go onto your website. So you do have to make sure it makes sense because the ultimate goal is to get people onto your site. Then you've got your meta descriptions, which is the section underneath that you see there in red. Um, it, this, again, is not visible in any part of your site. It's all in the HTML coding. Or if you use an SEO plugin, there'll be a meta description area. Um, but it's the little description under your title in search results. Um, so it doesn't actually affect your ranking in search engines, but if it's well written, it'll get people through to your website. So it's really, I would consider it to be like a mini ad for your web page, and it's completely free. Now, if you don't enter a meta description here, Google or other search engines will do it for you. And how they do it is they take a small sample of the um, from the text on your pages um, and then place it in there. So sometimes it's cut off. Sometimes it's not relevant to what you want it to say. Um, so make sure that you take control of that because, like I said, it, it's like a mini ad for your website and it's completely free. Now, for your business, I should say, it's completely free. But in here, you've only got 160 characters um, that you can use here. Don't use the same meta description for every page on your website. The description for each page should be unique. The content on each page of your website will be different and unique, so therefore your meta description should be as well. And then we've got alt tags and heading tags. So on the left, you've got alt tags. Now, these are tags used for images. So they're HTML tags that you can use to describe what an image is. Now, because a search engine web bot can't actually see an image, um, so if, the, if you don't have some kind of description or an alt tag, they will have no idea what it is or if it's relevant to the page. So obviously, um, having that description there really helps with the SEO on your page. Your images might come up in Google image searches and that kind of thing as well. Um, I would always recommend that you have local keywords or the title of the page with the keywords that you're trying to rank for in the images on that particular page. Uh, then you've got heading tags. Now, heading tags are really important for SEO. Uh, they help both the reader of your content, but also web bots to determine what the content is on your page and how important it is. So if you think of a website, it's got a main heading up the top. That should be, normally, that would be describing what the entire page is about. Um, and that should be labeled or tagged as an H1 tag. Um, then you've got subsequent H2, H3, H4. Um, they all, all of these headings carry different weights. Um, H1 is the most important, um, and then it goes down uh, from there. So they're basically indicators of context. So what's on the page and how does it relate to what the user is searching for? Um, so keep that in mind and make sure all of your headings, uh, headings sorry, are actually tagged appropriately using that structure. Now, if that's something you're unsure about, normally that's in the coding of your website, um, but speak to your web developer. So even, um, you know, ask them what, um, what they've set up by way of SEO um, and make sure that, again, it's based on keyword research. Um, so you need to know what people are searching and therefore that may determine what the heading of your, your page is. So certainly um, link the two always. All right, then we've got off-page SEO. Now, off-page SEO is everything that happens away from your website um, that uh, links back to your website. So it's actions that are essentially taken outside that impact your search engine results. Um, I find that off-page SEO or off-site SEO makes up the majority of your SEO strategy uh, because it is continual, um, it's continual sort of in nature of building the credibility of your website. You want your website to rank well above others that have a similar message. So in order to achieve that, you have to continually build your website's authority. Now, link building is another one, the number one way that you can do that. Um, that's the process of getting external pages to link to a page on your website. Now, it can be complicated and time-consuming. Um, not all links are created equal, so a, a link from a more authoritative website will make a much greater impact on a search engine's result page than a link from a newly built or a low-quality site. Um, so a web bot will count all of the links coming into your website, but as I mentioned, they're not all considered equal, so they'll give more weight to quality links and then rank accordingly. So if your site had 100 poor quality links um, and your competitor had 15 
fantastic or good quality leagues, the chances are that your competitor will rank higher than you. Um, also keep in mind that um, Google and other search engines have become very good at spotting a scam. So your, your link should be good quality. It should come from a trusted and a reputable site um, or a site that's related to your type of business. And I find that generally they're difficult to come by and require some kind of human intervention. So it could be something like a membership or it could be something like a business listing subscription or a conversation about working together and therefore um, that results in some kind of, uh, you know, links, reciprocal links and that kind of thing. Uh, but normally they where they're placed, they'll actually add value to the reader. So the reader will be reading a blog, for example, or we'll talk about um style of business that you are and then it will have a link to your business and therefore it's likely to be clicked. Now you can earn backlinks um, through you know producing great content and people wanting to share it. Um, you can build black backlinks by networking, relationship building, having memberships, that kind of thing, um, you know, working with bloggers or even the media. Um, you can create backlinks by adding your website to business directories um, and niche websites that might be relevant to your business. Now, a lot of these you might be able to do um, as free listings just to get um, that, that link. Um, but also check out your competitors. Um, I think that's one of the easiest ways to get backlinks it's, and it's often overlooked. But research your competitors, just do a Google search of their name. Um, and see what websites they come up for. Um, there could be um, some ideas there. And if the, the websites that they're on um, are relevant to your business, click through to them, um, see if the page includes a backlink to your competitor's page. And, and if so, perhaps look at pursuing the same opportunity for your business. Now, there's also non-link related um, off-page or off-site SEO. Um, so ex earning those external links from websites, certainly the most commonly practiced off-page SEO. Um, but uh, things like social media, um, other brand mentions that are non-linked um, can also really help with your SEO. So social media sends signals to search engines like Google. Um, so certainly consider that, that the um, quality of your content on social is absolutely crucial and the engagement that you're getting in social media as well. So the number of likes, comments, uh, shares, that overall interaction is going to be really, really important and send those signals. So it can really help from, from your off-page SEO perspective. Okay, now SEO is ranking organically when people search, but there's also SEM, which is search engine marketing. Um, now, with the search engine marketing, you can set up advertising uh, where you pay per click. Now, you may or may not have had experience um, with pay per click advertising. Um, we're not going to get into pay per click, um, so to speak, today. Uh, but I will tell you um, that obviously with any kind of Google ads um, or other pay-per-click advertising, you can be very targeted. But the key is knowing who your audience is and therefore targeting them specifically, um, demographically and geographically. Um, also behaviorally, knowing um, what sort of behaviors uh, they, they take as well in terms of uh, purchase behavior and other things. Um, so I'm only going to um, talk to you today about remarketing as opposed to Google ads in general, but remarketing done correctly is absolutely fantastic for increasing your brand awareness and really influencing conversions. And it can be really low cost. Um, so the concept is quite simple. Uh, you're basically reinforcing your brand to people who have already visited your website. Um, so if you have a look at the diagram on your screen, you've got a prospect that's come to your website and that could have been any number of ways. They could have seen your car driving past or they could have done a Google search or found you on social media. However, they've, um, they've found you, they've got to your website. Once they're on your website, they're tracked. And then when they leave your site, your ads start to appear in banners or pop-ups um, or even sometimes as text on other sites that they browse. So you will most definitely have been the recipient of remarketing. You may or may not have noticed it. I know, um, you know, some businesses are quite aggressive with it and you'll see a lot of repetition and, you know, you only have to go into, um, you know, some of the fashion sites or even, you know, you um, 
holiday planning sites and that kind of thing. And the remarketing is quite aggressive where you feel like, oh, they're following me. And um, But keep in mind, you set the rules around that. So you might only want your ad to pop up for a couple of days, a couple of times per day to a particular individual before you leave them alone. So you can really tone that, um, you know, tone it down a bit to suit your business. Again, knowing your market and knowing the behavior of your customer. Um, so remarketing is fantastic. Um, keep that in mind. Now, there's another type of retargeting that sits around the social media space. Um, it's sim very similar in that you've got um, some code on your website. People hit your site. However, they've got to your site, they're tracked. And then when they go back into social media, so Facebook and Instagram, your ads can then start to appear. So again, it's very effective um, and it can be a great way to increase brand awareness. People already have some kind of awareness of your business. You're just reinforcing uh, that message to them. So, you know, perhaps your customers are the type that do a lot of different searches um, before they make a decision. And so they could have been on three or four different company websites. You want them to remember you. Um, with remarketing um, on in the Google space, you only pay once they click and therefore they go back to your website. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, a very critical part of marketing effectively and doing so on a limited budget is controlling and measuring your marketing. So essentially, you have to define how you're going to measure something before you launch any advertising. Um, so in terms of controlling and measuring, make sure that you are defining that measurement before implementing anything and you evaluate absolutely everything that you do. Um, then compare your results. Um, to what your goals were and identify if there's any um, deviations in those. Um, if there are any deviations, you need to, to look at why there were deviations and perhaps formulate new plans and actions from there. So um, if you, let's say something went extremely well, you would exploit that opportunity, perhaps assign more budget to it or, um, you know, it lengthen the campaign so it was due to finish after a month, extend it to six weeks or two months. If it's not going as well, go back and have a look and correct those problems. Now, the beauty of everything online um, is that you don't have to wait until the end of a campaign and go, oh, that didn't go so well. You can be having a look at, um, you know, your results uh, and, and, and how things are going and updating, um, you know, as it goes within a few days, a week, two weeks. Um, so that can be continual. It's absolutely crucial that you are having that you have your finger on the pulse in terms of controlling and measuring uh, your um, actions here and making sure that you are continually tweaking campaigns. Um, try to follow the price and quantity objectives as well. Um, you know, stick to what you what you're planning, but continually tweak it. But also keep in mind, if conditions do change, um, you will have to adapt your marketing plan to fit conditions. So, for instance, let's say you had a you know you've got an outdoor venue and you had a really good um, campaign. Um, and it was focused around, you know, this outdoor venue, but there happened to be bad weather. You might want to completely pause that campaign and then restart it when the weather improves. Um, or you might need to revise quantity objectives um, if you're, you're failing to meet your targets. Um, also keep in mind that the best marketing plan is one that's reviewed often. So if you're learning lessons from one year, carry them over to the next, um, but make sure that you're you're doing so with your reporting. So the best way to be able to do that is not by memory to go, oh, yeah, I did that campaign last year and I remember it went really well, but um, you don't have any sort of um, solid evidence of that. I would look at doing monthly reporting so that you can actually track your spend as well as your sales and a range of other things. So just uh, before we finish up, um, this is where uh, your, your reporting and, and sort of some of these key metrics come into it. So what do you measure? Well, I'd recommend at a minimum you set up that monthly reporting to, to measure the items that I've got on your screen here. So things like sales and leads, what are your total sales in a period, let's say a month? Um, what were your sales for specific products and services? Um, what did you spend on marketing? So what was the cost associated with your, your lead acquisition? And what was your conversion rate? So versus, um, you know, inquiry to actual sales, what was that, um, that percentage? Um, then your web stats. So things like your unique users to your site are really important. Um, your sessions, um, which is similar to unique users, but, you know, one visitor could return repeatedly. Um, how many pages they viewed. Um, that's a really good way to uh, measure how deep people are going onto your website. 
um, and keep track of that and also look if there's variations, you know, month to month. Um, goals and conversions that you can set up online through your Google Analytics, for example, and then referral traffic. So where is your web traffic actually coming from? Also look at social media statistics, but the key um, mechanism here or the key measurement should be engagement. So not the number of posts that you posted in a month, not the number of likes that you got, but what true engagement did you get per post? And that really comes by way of a combination of likes, comments, and shares. But obviously people are more deeply connected if they are commenting and sharing versus just a simple like. Um, and once again, we have got extensive or an extensive range of webinars and workshops on social media. So that could be um, something that you'll consider. And the purpose of today's webinar is really to touch on some of the key areas that you could consider from a strategic marketing perspective, obviously with the strategy sitting behind any of these individual tactics that we've discussed. Um, but please reach out and find more information on any of the areas that we've gone over today. Now, that does conclude um, today's session on strategic marketing on a shoestring budget. I hope it makes sense and I hope there's some things that you can take out of it to improve uh, your marketing or perhaps understand your marketing a little bit more. And I do hope that you um, will develop a strategy if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to stay on now and answer any questions, but just keep in mind, we've only touched or scratched the surface so and touched on a few areas there. Um, is a lot of support available through the Digital Solutions Program if you want more information. Um, we have a range of webinars and workshops. You can also um, apply to work with a mentor and get, for just $44, you can get three hours of one-on-one -on -one or three one-on-one -on -one sessions with a digital advisor and then make up a, a seven-hour package with webinars and workshops on top of that. Um, there is a little bit of eligibility around that. Um, to do that through us, this is a Commonwealth Government program that we're responsible for in WA, Queensland and NT. Um, you have to be a business operating for profit and you have to employ fewer than 20 full-time staff. So the link is on my screen, so jot that down if you're interested. Um, but as I mentioned, I'll stay on now and answer any questions that you might have. Um, thanks so much for joining today and good luck with your marketing. All right, guys, it doesn't look like there are any questions coming through. So I'm going to end today's webinar. But thank you once again for joining me and enjoy the rest of your week.